MRSA and sepsis, and you know, he was on the, the edge quite a few times, and God brought him back, right? And we did a fundraiser for him at RCBC through the whole community, and we were able to raise $3,000 for the building. <laughs> I'm a numbers guy, man. We did over 15 pounds of pancakes, right? That's a lot of pancakes, man. We did over 200 eggs, 200 sausage patties, man. We had about 200 and some odd people rotate through. And, you know, it was a pretty big deal for uh, RCBC. So, anyways, I thought that was pretty cool and I wanted to share that. So, the other thing is next weekend will be our one year anniversary in this building. Does it seem like we've been in this building for a year? <laughs> so our very first church service, we had to prop the doors open. Brian, you were here, right? Yep. Yeah. Brian did a little acoustic set. I think Helen or somebody brought little battery operated lanterns and we set them up and, and we had the sunlight coming in and no plumbing and no electricity and it kind of, yeah, anyways, it just say, you know, a year, like a lot of this happened in a year, man. You know, the churches were all shut down and, and you know, we're doing church kind of on the, on the down low and, you know, over time, you know, week after week after week, we've been blessed and, you know, you sit here and you look at this building now compared to where it was the first day we walked in here. And it pretty much looks the same, but a bunch of people in there, so that's pretty cool too. Anyways, anyways, good stuff, man. So Frankie, where's Frankie at today? Anybody know? Honeymoon. Honeymoon, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so y'all keep Penny in prayer, okay? She's been married to Frankie for 23 years. Man. <laughs> And they're out celebrating today, all right? And it's important, you know, to do it on the day that, you know, he got married on. So, anyways, that's why he's not here. But you know what? We get we get a twofer with Brian, right? So Brian's not only just killing him with the music, but he's also going to be the, the preacher for today. So, anyways, that's good stuff, right? All right. Swap meet next weekend. First Sunday of each month. Next Thursday, if there's no Bible study, absolutely, I get excited about that too. So, swap me, right? Yeah. So, what's that? You sure? Yeah, because Webster's the first Sunday. Frankie or Timmy? All right. <laughs> Second Sunday, so you know what? We ain't doing nothing next Sunday, so that's good. But hey, this Thursday coming up, it's the first Thursday of each month we do the, the open house type deal here, right? Or bike night. So come on out. It's it's again it's a time to just kinda of hang out, fellowship, get to know the people to your left, right, so on and so forth, and just not really have an agenda but to get to know each other. So um Brian, I think that's about it, bro. So it's raining, so if your helmet's out there hanging from your handlebars upside down, just make sure you dump it out before you put it on your head, all right? And with that said, look to your left, right, front, and back, give a howdy, a handshake, a head nod, a fist bump to your partner and your neighbor. Love you, that's for you, Michael Church. We're glad you're here. Love y'all.
maybe this envelope, and I came up here and I put it down, did all the flag waving, and I totally forgot to make her announcement. So, as I'm transitioning, Brian's getting ready. No, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> it ain't the first time. So, hey, <laughs> pro life, man. Check it out. Here's a petition, right? It's grassroots. It's for the state of Florida. The only way that we're going to get something on about, about pro life and protecting, protecting vulnerable life is a grassroots deal, right? And the only way we're going to make that happen is to get about 900,000 signatures, okay? And all the churches throughout Florida have, have partnered and they're pushing this piece, right? So anyways, not a whole lot of personal information has to go on these petitions. The petitions will be in the back after church. If you want, it takes about a minute to fill out. But anyways, they're back there. Jen, am I at the doghouse now? No? Okay. Hi. I don't know what's up. And with that said, Brian! Woo! Good evening, everybody. That's what Chris says, right? It's good to see you guys. Good to be here. I'm having some, uh, if you don't know, I'm, I'm stepping back a little bit so I can focus on my family time. That's why you don't see me every week. I am a worship pastor at my church, my other church, in, in New Smyrna. So I'm there every Sunday, and I was helping out as much as I could here every Saturday, but working every day, and my wife, she wanted some time. So. so that's why you don't see me. So, But I am so happy to be here when I can. I love this place. I love what we do here. Let's go ahead and start off in prayer. Father, we're just amazed at who you are. You're such a good, good father. And tonight we, we want to focus more of ourselves, more of our, our, our focus of worship unto you. And understand what it means to be with you. And to sing to you and to live for you. A sacrifice of worship unto you. So tonight we want to clear off what we think we know and open up our hearts to understand more about who you are so we can give worship unto you. So maybe we can so, let me grab my other guitar, because I am a worship pastor, so I'm always playing and doing something. But, not that I'm going to hold this whole time, it's not a security bump, I promise. I knew this. But, we're going to talk about worship tonight. And we're going to talk about what it means to really engage and try to enhance our worship. So, there's songs like, you know, How Great Is Our God that we can go through. Can you turn on my Anyway, but we have songs that we can sing and we can do in routine. Some song like this has been around for a long time, even like the Good Good Father has been around together. If we understand his greatness, these aren't just gonna be words that we sing, they're gonna be something that's in prayer from our heart, right? Otherwise, we could go and listen to any band. Bands that are way better than me, that's why we pay and go to see concerts and stuff. But when we gather here, it's really about lifting all of our voice in one song to him. This is worth it, right? So we sing, Great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all we see how great, how great is our God. Now, if I didn't have passion for him, and I have a way to sing to him, and I've sang that song 300 times because it is basically like the Leonard Skinner, Simple Alabama of Christian music, right? Tom is basically Skinner. So, we know that as a worship guy, and even when we get to Christmas time, you can ask all my guys for band for Christmas music going, not Christmas songs. Because, yeah. well, they haven't changed in 100 years, we're playing the same ones over and over and I'm trying to be passionate because we're singing enough for us. Try to remind them all the time. But what if I came in and I led worship for you guys? Trying to bring us all into it. I don't know how you worship this Bounce all over the place. But what if I came in and I was just so disassociated? No relationship with God. And I just came in and did the numbers. <laughs> yes. I, I lip synced it in, that's what it was. No, but if I came in and just how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all we see how great. Now I'm not off pitch, necessarily, and, and I'm, I can hold the tune, but if I'm not coming from here with it, he doesn't, he doesn't need that. That's just plain, gone, it's a symbol that makes noise. 
And that's what he talks about in the scripture, is saying, when you come to me, it's your heart that I want. So the words that you put on the screen, and anytime I sing in here, I want to have words on the screen. So even if you're not a singer, you're singing in your head, and you have the words of a prayer coming out of your mind, out of your heart, unto God. So that, that to me is what I want as when I come up to the worship with you guys. It's not, hey, little cool, band's here, that's fine, we'll get around to it, you know, we can chat, we can do this, and have all these things, we'll do some or whatever that game is, and you know, we'll play a game of chess over here, that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, to me, it's one of those things where if we can go to a football game, and we can cheer, and we can act crazy, and paint our face with all kinds of colors, and wear stuff, and if we can go to a concert, and we can see famous people, and we can see bands, I love this song, and we're jumping up and screaming, and yet we come into his throne, in his throne room, and we, we listen to, well, he's not gonna cross for us. You know, we, this would be a Super Bowl every time we gather. Right? This would be one of those things that we are idiotic about. When you, when you read scripture, you see David, and he says, I have yet to defy myself to the Lord. He's dancing around like an idiot because he just loves him so much. So, for me, that's why I'm passionate about it. So, that's why we, we're gonna talk a little bit about worship tonight. So, we take this off. My security blanket's gone, so now I have to focus. <laughs> so anyway, that's just to start. Just to say, how do we engage? How do we enhance our worship and make it understood that it's about his greatness, about who he is, and not just the music that we listen to, not just something that we do in the morning, not a prayer, not a ritual, not a routine. Well, it's all about relationship. It's about engaging in relationship with him, so much so that Everything that you live and breathe and do is for him because you love him, right? So I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I don't have any crazy dad jokes like Frankie does. I probably should have pulled some, or I should have left me some, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> we're good, Brian. We're good. We're good. All right. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm sure I could find some. I think it's like a prerequisite to be a pastor. You got to find these jokes. But anyway, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I'm not sure the year. I don't remember exactly, but I was probably middle school. And I was a lot younger, and I wasn't the cool guy that you see right now. I wasn't like really awesome and cool. I was chubby, goody goody nerd, right? Um, I wasn't popular. I might have got picked on a little bit. But most kids in those early school years, in elementary and middle school, they only knew me because of maybe two things. One was that I ruined the curve on the test because I usually did really good, and they were like punching me after class. Again, really? You had to get a 95? I'm like, well, I need the answers. Yeah. So I was always getting in trouble for that. Or the fact that my older brother and my older cousin were like the football stars, and those were the guys that were like, yeah, he's Brian's good. He's, he's Mike and Chris owner in Brian's school. So I was like that kid, like the younger brother that tagged along. My brother was the only one that could hit me kind of thing, you know? No one hits my brother except me, you know? <laughs> but one year, I don't know if you guys are from around here, but we have a skating rink. I don't know if they're still, no, they got repurposed into an auto shop or something, but it was Skate City. Yeah. And back in the 80s, that was a place to be. And I was too young to know all the fun stuff that was actually going on. But they had parties and they had things that we would do. We would show up and they had like syrupy soda, really, really syrupy. And they had dried out cardboard pizza, but we had to be there and we had to have fun. And we would have a pizza party there, that kind of thing. Well, again, I wasn't the most popular kid, but I had a good group of four friends that we had. And, you know, that's really all we need. And, but I, I said, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a party there. And my mom's like, who are you gonna invite? Whole class, even the cool kids, right? So the cool kids, huh? they actually came to my party. I was so stoked. I was like, you're coming, really? I'm gonna wear my cool shirt, my Cavarici pants. You know, I'm, I'm gonna skate real good, you know? This place, you know, it's the kind of had the disco lights and you know, this rink, and they played MC Hammer and Metal Ice at the time, and it was like, that's what was happening. Well, these guys show up, we pay for the tickets, we give them the cardboard pizza, we give them the syrupy soda, and they disappear. They're not hanging They didn't come to hang They came back for cake, maybe, and it was just really my poor friends, right? It's the only thing that was really there. And I'm not telling you this story to be all sappy or like that really, but I remember that was, they showed up for just roots and stuff. They showed up and got what they needed. They didn't pay honor to the host, right? The reason I'm telling that story is that I think that we do that to God a lot of times in our worship. We show up to his party, we come for what we want, we show up barely, and then we disappear and we go pay attention to other things. 
So in our day to day life, we show up. He's done this amazing thing. When we wake up and walk outside and breathe fresh air and see the sunshine, he did that. That was his thing. That's so glorious, right? But all I can think of is late for work. Oh, you know, he's not. I haven't given him the glory that he deserves for what he's done. So sometimes I think we show up in worship. Because worship is more than just music. I hope everyone understands that. It's how you live and how you respond to him. We'll get into the definition a little bit more. But it's a reaching gift if we do it that way. It's just a customary song that we sing to him. And we neglect them. And we focus on others and enjoy the performance of those in front of us. You know, so like these ten year old friends, we might leave without any twins of conscience, no, no issue. We might be totally unaware of the insens insensitivity to the host, convinced that we have fulfilled an obligation. Well, I went, my mom made me go. Well, I went to church. Now I'm good for the week, right? But did you engage? Did you participate in the relationship that he already has for us? You know, it's not that he's the weak side of the relationship. We are. So we gotta fix ourselves so we can engage in that relationship. So, what kind of relationship do we have with the Lord where we miss recognizing his greatness in our worship? Do we analyze our own relationship on a daily basis? I don't, I miss all the time. And I remind myself, oh, I really need to refocus, refocus. This stuff happens. Bills are due. You know, your kid grows up, she moves out into a, you know, with her boyfriend, and you know, you're happy about that. See my face? No, they're nice, that's cool. Anyway, so I would say to encourage you guys to self-examine your relationship with God. Be intentional about it. Remind yourself to engage in a relationship. If you check my phone alarms, you'll see at 7.30 when I'm on the road to work, I have a reminder to pray. Pops up, I see it on my watch, I see it on my phone, whatever it be, bing, and like, I have nothing else to do on that 30 minutes. Except listen to some morning talk show guys laugh at themselves when they're really not all that funny, or I could actually think about my brother, think about my wife, pray, engage in, God, thank you for this day, and, and have prayer. I can remind myself. You think that I would be on point. I'm a worship pastor. I should remember this. No. I'm, my back's hurting. I'm late for work. The dog pooped everywhere. I got an issue. Yeah. Bing. Right. Everything is more important. Right? So be intentional about how you engage in that relationship. So what is worship in general? See, I think, really quick, you can say worship is a response to love. Right? That's really what it is. You see his greatness. You see Jesus. You see what he's done for us. How do we respond? It's a response of love. But we're going to dive into a little further to kind of hash it out. See, worship is a response of love to the greatness of God that culminates in a relationship growth. I'll say it again. Our response of love to the greatness of God that culminates in relationship growth. So... Not just on Sunday, but in every day of our, in an area of, area of our life, our family life, our work life. Yes, you worship at work when you're engaging with your boss, who might not be the nicest guy, but your response in that situation is a response of love that can happen in its worship towards God. You'll notice that when you do that, you'll have people that'll come up to you and say, man, your character, you, you just seem always so genuine. Where'd you get that? Well, I love God first. And then from everything else of that, it all spills over. Just my cup overflow, right? So, you also have worship in your friendships and your relationships. That's huge. Talking about not just, you know, your spouse. Let's remember that. <laughs> you can worship in the Lord and take care of your spouse and love the one that you're with so much. Your self-worth, that's a big one. If you don't love yourself, how can you love God? That's, that's, a, that's a tough one. People that I, you know, especially I know some moms that they'll take care of their kids, they'll take care of their husband, and yet they have issues where they don't love themselves. And I say, how can you give everything of yourself to God if you hold back in your giving? In your schoolwork, in our behavior, in our decision making, basically every part of your life can be worshiped for the Lord, a living sacrifice unto God. See, God created us to worship Him and to have a relationship with Him. He wanted our companionship. That relationship fell into jeopardy with the fall of man in Genesis. And God has been preparing to restore that relationship ever since then. 
Worship is a way to communicate with the Lord and to get to know Him on that intimate level, to build that relationship. So when we invite you to engage in that worship, it's not because He has a big ego and wants to, He wants you. He wants a relationship. He wants your heart. So, therefore, it's an effort towards restoration of that relationship with God. So I, I read in the book a while back that it's known that Jesus said the greatest commandment is this. You shall love the Lord with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's Matthew 23, 37. See, now while it's simplistic to say that worship is love, a response, a reflection of love, it's a fact that what we love most will determine what, or better yet, who we genuinely worship. Does that make sense? What we love most will actually, if you go to someone and say, I can clearly see that you love the Lord because of the way that you behave. Or, I can clearly see that you love drugs because of the way you behave. I can clearly see that you love porn because of the way you behave. More so than any part of your other world. You know? Does it make sense? What you're focusing on, where your treasures are, that's where your heart is, right? So, this is why I'm so passionate about worship, because it means so much. Our worship is our way to express to the Lord our love for Him, our awe for Him, and build strength in that relationship with the Lord that He wants and desperately seeks us to restore. So we remember that it's not His side that is the weak connection, I've said that. It's our side that has to have the fixing. We're the ones that focus on all so many other things and neglect to sing to Him properly. We put the words up because I want you to understand what we're saying. I don't want it to be just, yeah, that, that sounded great. I want that to be your prayer as it's my prayer. So I always tell the band, the band members that we have, I want you to know the words that we're, that we're playing. That it's your prayer too because when you play, people will know, man, even though he's playing bass or even though he's playing keys, he believes what he's playing, right? So how do we do it? I would say that every child of God can build or strengthen their relationship with the Lord by enhancing their offering of worship. And so how do we do that? We do it in three ways. We should enter into worship with the expectation of encountering the greatness of God. Yes, we expect His greatness. Okay? So that's how we enter in. That we're drawn to and we're focused on Jesus Christ. And that we engage in worship empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because after all, He was left for us as a God and as a way to the Father. So, therefore, we can put all that together to find worship as our response of love, as encountering the greatness of God in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, all wrapped up to build our relationship. Let me say it again. Encountering the greatness of God in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that leads us to the restored relationship. That's why it's important. It's not just a song service before service. And it shouldn't be only at Saturday night when we gather that we focus on worship. This should be all day, every day, all through the week. It's preparation for what's to come. Because after all, when we make it to heaven, that's what we're doing, folks. We're singing holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. Day in and day out. And I don't think we're going to think of anything else that we'd rather do. So, for the rest of this, we're just going to focus on the greatness of God. Um, this is actually something that I revamped from a series that I did where we talked about the triune God and worship. And if I get the chance to speak here again, we'll go over the next two. But for this one, we're going to focus on Father God and some of the songs we did tonight. Encountering the greatness of God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I read that passage in Psalm 145. Greatness is unsearchable. And I got stuck there. His greatness, I, what does that mean? Well, I want to know how great it is. I always think of the story like you would say, okay, well, how big is it? And the little kid says, how big is it? He said, well, think of how big you can think he can possibly be, and he's bigger than that. Yeah, but how big is he? Bigger than that. Well, I know, but now I put him in that bubble, man. We put him in our own little world, our own little bubble, and call him God. He's bigger than all that. It is unsearchable. We can't see the end of it. So when we engage in encountering his greatness, we should, that should overflow in our worship because that's powerful. So, God is so great that the human mind cannot fathom him. But the human heart can love him and tell others how great he is. His greatness is unsearchable. God's character and awesome works furnish us with more than enough material 
to fuel our worship for eternity. His greatness is unsearchable. It will take many worshipers and a long duration, as in forever and ever, even to begin to do justice of what the Lord deserves and the glory that we should give Him. And a great part for us is that we will have the rest of eternity to learn more and more about and grow in relationship with the Lord. But why not start now? Why not start here in preparation? So understanding the greatness of God means that we must learn of His attributes. Learn more about Him. How do we do that? We dive into the Word. We, we seek Him in the Word and find out. There's actually really good studies. If you just type in attributes of God, you'll, you can spend an entire four or five years just learning about that. But we're going to go over some of them quickly. We don't have that kind of time, right? At least, right? Frank would say, oh, we keep going. No. It's a time, right? Spirituality. John 4, 23 24. But the hour is coming and is now here. For the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must work, worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, meaning that God, being spirit, could not be represented by any physical object or likeness, not man-made idol that they have tried in the past. Eliminating the practice of idolatry or nature worship. He's not restricted by any physical location. He's omnipresent, meaning that he cannot be contained in that little box that we create for him. So focusing on his spirituality will help us magnify his greatness. Life. God is alive. He is characterized by life. His name alone assures us that I am. He is the living God. His life is different from all other life. Because it has always been and always will be. All of creation, all other beings have life in God and through God. Yet God has life in himself. That's one of those things that you can really spend some time trying to understand and grasp. But I think we could spend the rest of the time just focusing on loving one another. Right? We can spend the rest of our days focusing on that alone, and we can get up there and ask him, so this whole omnipresent thing, how does that work? Because <laughs> I don't understand it as a human. His personality. I love this about God. He is personal. He's an individual being with self-consciousness and will, and capable of feeling, choosing, and having a reciprocal, a give-and-take relationship with us. Focusing on his personality will help magnify his greatness. Infinity. God is not limited by space, by time, by knowledge, nor power. So these are all those omnis that you hear whenever you get the theology. Omnipotence, meaning that he's all-powerful. So theologians regard God as having supreme power. And this means that God can do basically what he wants, when he wants, where he wants. It means that he is not subject to physical limitations, like man is. God has the power over wind, over water, over gravity, over physics. After all, he created it all. God's power is infinite or limitless. He's omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. God is all-knowing in the sense that he's aware of past, present, and future. Nothing takes him by surprise. His knowledge is total. He knows all that there is to know and all that there can be known. Omnipresence, meaning all-present. This term means that God is capable of being everywhere at the same time. Now, this is one of those that I would also ask him, how, how do you do that? Mind blown. But it's in Scripture, it's in Jeremiah, it's in Psalms, it's in Matthew, where it mentions that he is omnipresent. There's no place that he does not inhabit. He is everywhere all at once. And so for me, that's one of my favorite things about him, because insignificant little me in this building on 8th Street in Hollywood, even though there's major things going on, he still has time to be right here with us. That makes me feel really awesome. His greatness is unsearchable. So we focus on worship and we, we think that there's maybe two types. There's relationship building and there's distracted worship through our daily life, right? So what gets your focus? What gets the worship that he deserves? We come to the table bringing half-hearted efforts of praise sometimes. Praise and worship. And I know that I've been guilty of this myself. I, I know that um, it's something that I think we all do, but we have to reassess examine our lives and make sure that we stay focused because he is worthy. I think he deserves that. So, our intentions are to give him all the glory and honor, but sometimes we fall short. One of my favorite, my passage, my favorite life verse is Romans 3, 23, that all fall short of the glory of God. 
my band that we have for my other church is Common Ground Band. We all fall short. We are Common Ground. Let's all give him praise, right? So we all, if we all fall short, I think we understand our intentions are right. But yeah, we fall, but he's okay. He's a big guy. He, he, can, he can take it. But get back up and get refocused. So, a relationship is not where it should be or where it could be. I read this before that distracted worship is, it could be anything from superficial to the serious. Deadlines, unpaid bills, a friend's unkind comment, lab test for cancer, that thump thump noise in your car or your bike that's making you right? A rebellious child, some resurfacing sin that we can't shape, so we feel that we're, we can't come into his presence, right? There's some sin that we can't just get rid of, it grabs a hold of us and we, we try and try, and yet then when we fall back into that sin, we go, I can't go to church today. There's no way, he, he knows what I'm doing, with. I can't do that today. He's big enough. He's great enough to let you come, come as you are. But again, refocus, reassess. He asks, what size did God appear to be when our mind is preoccupied with all the cares and worries and concerns of life? He's pretty small, right? No. He is great. Magnifying and cherishing and adoring his greatness at the, is at the heart of biblical worship. Right? It's magnifying and cherishing, adoring his greatness. That's what we're doing when we sing the songs that we just sang. That's what we're doing when we gather in friendship and fellowship that we have here tonight. That's what we're doing when we ride safely home and follow the laws that we have in the land. All of that is worship for our God. So, every child of God can build and strengthen their relationship with the Lord by enhancing their offering of worship. It's all about relationship. So, in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man. But why? Why make us? Why not stop with the birds and the fish? The four-legged creatures, because he wanted relationship with us. He wanted companionship. He wanted that with you, with me, with everybody in this room, everybody in this county, across the world. He still wants relationship with us. Now, granted, it's not as it was intended to be. He knows that. Because of everything that's taken place in, in Genesis and the fall of man and all the stuff that's happened. And ever since then, he's been seeking you. He's been seeking all of us to have that relationship restored. For us to become righteous. Righteous at the right hand of God. That's where he wants us to be. So. It's about relationship. I love that. The great news is that even though we may not always get this right, he will always be there waiting for us. He has never given up on us and never will until we are restored unto him. Our relationship with him is worth everything. How do I know this? Because our Father in heaven sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us to be restored unto him. For our sins to be wiped away and we gain, regain righteousness in his eyes. So while we are here, in his presence, experiencing his creation, his love, his mercy, his grace, we encounter the greatness of God. And it is our response, our true response, to his greatness that our worship begins to truly flow. So the next time we gather, next time we go anywhere, the next time you're focusing on God in that manner, remember his greatness. So I remember a while back for me when worship really took form. My mom had cancer. This was back in 2006. Um, for years, my dad was the one that we were worried about because we found out when we were way younger that he had a tumor. So we focused on his health way all the time. He would spend all his money and not buy the pills he needed to keep the tumor small. And we're like, what are you doing? You have to take this pill. And he's like, it's $400 a pill. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of important that you're here. So we focused on him a lot. But then my mom fell. It was close to Thanksgiving. And she had x-rays and found that she had cancer. Multiple, multiple my mom. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about this. It's probably worked up. But it has been 2006 when she passed away. And at the time, I had a foundation in church. I had start, started to play some. I hadn't committed everything to him. Because I had been in bar bands and played at No Name Saloon as a house band. I played all around town with, you know, just bike week events, all that kind of stuff. 
And I had started to play a church, and I started to have a, a church family. But I went there because my daughter was three years old. And I said, well, I gotta be a good dad, and she's gotta know who God is, because I grew up, and I, you know, that's why I'm here. That's why I said, no, I was there for me too. So, but at the time, this all happened, and lo and behold, I had this church family that just surrounded us whenever we found out she had cancer. We found out uh, November, right before Thanksgiving, and she was gone January 13th. Okay, and so this is quick. But there was a point that, you know, this relationship with God that I had kind of haphazardly building, right? I hadn't sang the song truly just yet until one night. This was the night that we went to the facility where they were keeping me. And this is the night that they, my parents decided to tell us that she was just going to come home. She's not going to fight. It's just overtaking her. There's not enough time. She'd rather die in peace at our house. And I'm like, we just, we just started to fight. And we're done, you know. So obviously I'm worried about myself, worried about her, you know. All this stuff's going through my mind. And I get in my car to leave to come home. I was by myself. And I had a back, remember CDs, right? <laughs> I had a big old CD case. And it's funny because all my friends in the band knew that I was focusing more on God because all my regular CDs were now missing. And this, you know, book, remember the big books, the CDs? I flipped and, hey, hand me that one. Well, they're all Mercy Me and Big Daddy Weave and Christian bands. And so I grabbed a Big Daddy Weave CD, put it in, and this song comes up. Um, <laughs> and it really hit me as far as. The song is, it says it's not about you, it's all about me. It kind of sets up to understand that everything that's going on, I was focused on myself, focused on what was, how did I feel about it? Yet my mom was suffering, and God was going to take care of me, right? And so this song comes on the radio. I pull it up, right? It goes like this. It's not about me. It's all about you. It's not about my pride It's all about the truth It's all right from the start I open up my heart And say, Lord, here's every part It's all about you Mom's going to be passing away. This, you know, we had weeks and we ended up having Christmas. You can keep playing if you want. We had Christmas in that facility, which was weird. You know, everything's changing. My dad doesn't know where he's going to go. My dad's been, he was with my mom since they, they got married. He, she was 15, he was 17. He got her out of a bad situation where she was abused. Been with her for 30 something years. He doesn't know anything else. Here I am driving home, and that's the song that I hear. It's not about me. It's all about him. And then, so then I said to folks, well, it's all about him, and he loves me. And he's taking care of my mom, right? But I'm gonna give everything that I have, and it starts here. It starts in that moment that I ended up quitting the other man, and I focused my life into just whatever I can in ministry. To the Lord. That's right. That's what I said. But it's just one of those things for me, that's what changed, and that's within that moment, that it wasn't just a song. There was greatness about that moment. My God was huge. All these things that I was learning about, all that relationship stuff that I was figuring out, here he is one, I'm right here. It's not about all this stuff that's going on, it's about me and you in a relationship. My mom had a relationship with me. I didn't know that type of relationship, you know? So I think it's one of those things where we, we come across and we go, I knew of God. I just didn't know him. But I knew him that night. And from that point on, it came into, you know, I went to my, now granted my band members are actually now coming to my church, most of them. But they knew at the time, they're like, when I said, guys, I'm actually going to quit and start 
I'm leading worship on Sunday mornings. I'm like, yeah, we knew this was coming. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Because that plane until three in the morning, I gotta get up and go to church here in about three hours. So, but that's like when Frankie knew, you know, that we were coming here. Of course, he, he kind of tricked me too because he said, "Well, I need some, I need some help with music." And I said, well, "Frankie, I'm already committed over here." He goes, "It's on Saturday." I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. So, I love being here. I love having that chance to just engage in a relationship. And if I can take all y'all into that realm with me and get to know him better, then we're doing what we're supposed to do. It's not about the sound and the lights and all this stuff. The only reason we do any of that is to let your guard down a little bit. If it's not at a certain decibel level, you might not sing. Because you might hear yourself and go, hmm, are they hearing me too? So there's a reason that we do everything that we do. If it feels like a classroom in here because all the lights are on, hmm, how do you drop your guard and say, I've had a bad week. I just found out this is my mom. And I just found out my mom's sick. Or I just found out my brother's ill. I just lost my job. You put up all those walls and you come in and you forget his greatness. So I'm challenging you to reassess, realign, and focus on God. So, wrap this up. It's a good time. What does this look like in our everyday life? If we are understanding the simplest version of the definition of worship, worship is love, then we must again perform that self-examination on a regular basis. If worship is love and we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, does that mean that we can't love anything else? No. But it does mean this. We can't love anything in the right way unless we love God more. Unless we love God first. Put Him first in every situation, and it just trickles down. Everything else will work itself out. What or who is getting your priority in worship? What or who is getting half-hearted, distracted worship? When we come in here, is something else taking up our time and moments and stuff? And yes, we're here, and that's good, but are you here? Are you engaged in a relationship with Him? Not here, but this one. These eternal desires that only God can fill. If we aren't careful, we will love things that aren't as worthy as God. So be intentional. Self-examine. Take a close look at your life outside of Sunday morning. What do you enjoy the most? I, I, I read a book about character once and it said, it's just a quick tangent, but if you're watching a certain television program and you used to laugh at it, just for, imagine this, and this, you'll probably get mad at me later. Imagine Jesus is sitting next to you. Is he laughing? Probably not. And that changed. <laughs> I would put on certain movies. I'm like, I love this. I watched this when I was in high school. Ooh, yes. I can't watch that anymore. That is just bad. That's not what and That's not what I need to be focused on. Especially if you're a believer in Christ, because people, they're watching. And they see who you are, and they say, oh, so he's a Christian? I guess I don't mean that much if he's able to laugh at that. That's tough. So, what do you laugh at? What makes you happy? What makes you sad? Answers to these questions will expose the God or God's little G that you love. Do you love the Lord and Savior? Or do you worship other things? So, relationship building worship is our response of love as we encounter the greatness of God in Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit that leads us to the restored relationship He wants. So, hopefully, next time I'll be able to dive in a little more about worshiping with Jesus as the focus, and then we can talk about worshiping through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I, I just thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for everything you do for us. I thank you that you're patient with us and you let us learn these things. And, and whenever we get distracted and we have distracted worship through the week, that you're a big God and you can handle it. But in this moment, I pray and I, I just want to encourage myself, encourage everyone here, that we reassess, we walk outside these doors and see the greatness of God. That people, when they see us, they can see a love relationship that we have for you. And I pray if there's anybody in this building tonight that doesn't know you in that way, that isn't um, in relationship with you, that if they want to find that, they come up and they talk with you. Because it's just so quick to be able to find you. You're so ready and willing and able 
because you are a magnificent, majestic Father. It's your name we pray.